Matt Wallman's a senior staff writer for Football Guys and the creator of the insanely in-depth rookie scouting portfolio. He's been in the fantasy football analysis space for over 20 years. He's got more film breakdowns on Twitter than almost anyone else on earth. He's got a great beard game too. These are his late round perspectives. Like, this is why I love doing late round perspectives is because, uh, you know, like I, I always reference Bloom's on the couch, of course, because Bloom has been doing this thing for years where he's just chilling, talking. And you've obviously been part of that journey, too. Sure. And I, I, I just cushion on that couch. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you, there's an, there's, a, there's a, a Matt Waldman butt indent on that on that couch. Um but like, like I, I, I really wanted to do this show because, you know, I do the solo show with the late round podcast. I don't have that many opportunities for guests and such. And like you and I have at least conversed on Twitter for like a decade at this point. Yeah. <laughs> like it's been a really long time. <laughs> it's crazy. And so I, I was you know very, very pumped. Like it was this is the first year during draft season and I'm doing late round perspectives. And I thought to myself, this is the perfect opportunity, especially like, you know, I'm I'm angling this and, and approaching the prospecting stuff through analytics and i love you know i had norris on on the last perspectives episode uh now you coming on being able to give that other perspective on all of this stuff is really really important so i just have to say all that being said i'm so excited to finally sit down and talk to you about this stuff and likewise because when you reached out to me i was like oh this is going to be awesome because yeah. we have talked on on twitter for over a decade yeah and i was like you know i've i've always respected the work that you do and i Appreciate and you've that. done a fantastic job of that and i'm congratulations on you know on doing this as your own thing as an independent thing Thank um, you. and having success with that because as someone who does that as well on on my own and with the rsp I, you know, it's a small club of people That's and, right. and you know what, you know, what goes on behind that. Exactly. So, you know, exactly. it's, it's nice to get a chance for us to chop it up. For sure, man. You know, I, I, uh, you know, I, I just talked about how you and I sort of approach this stuff from different perspectives. Uh, you know, you've been in the scouting game and doing this. Has it been like 20 years? You said, I think it, I've, I've seen this coming year will be year 20 for yeah. the book. And it has been 20 years that I've been doing it. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, that's crazy. And I feel like uh, people out there listening to this, maybe you've done this in the past. People love to pit us against each other randomly on Twitter <laughs> and such, right? Like it's like, it's like, oh, I have a take. And then some other guy who approaches things differently has the opposite take. Therefore, you guys need to spend the next three hours on Twitter going back and forth about it's like, let's just relax a little bit, guys. Let's let's calm down yeah. for a second here. Um, yeah. but I did want to ask you, can you just sort of describe? I mean, look, your your RSP, the research scouting portfolio is out of control. I was looking at this year's and I can't even describe how much information is in that. Like I thought I was a sicko with some of this stuff. Like you <laughs> you're, you're you're sick, Matt. Like there there is yeah. there is there is a sickness uh with what you're doing. I mean you're you went cuz like a lot of people that uh you know I'll talk to on shows and stuff, um a lot of it is they haven't necessarily dug into the pseudo uh undrafted you know seventh round type guys a lot of it especially early on in like february march a lot of it is like yeah i've taken a look at maybe the day one day two guys but you're not only look because i look at every guy that goes to the combine right so that's a decent right. amount, you know it's like 80 guys or whatever yeah. running back and wide receiver but then i look at yours and there are players on there that i didn't even know existed on planet earth that you're <laughs> <laughs> that you're analyzing. I'm like, my gosh, this is a, a, a true sickness. But I just want to ask, how how would you just describe your process overall and how you're approaching this stuff? Sure. Um, you, you know, first of all, I would like to joke that I'd like to joke that, you know, maybe they want to pit us together like you're Wolverine and I'm Deadpool, there you know, I mean, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> or vice versa. I don't know, you right. know, however we want to look at it. Right. Um, but, y you know, the RSP is really rooted in operations management and quality management principles that I learned in a different lifetime. So I really took what, you know, as Dwayne McFarlane at Fantasy Life and used to, you know, work with me a little bit at the RSP when early on in his career would say as a an avid reader before we got started was like, you're an analytics person and nobody realizes it. Like yeah. you're hiding, you're hiding behind film, but you're an analytics person. I said, yeah, and, and I, I appreciate that you understand that because yeah. What I really did is I took quality management principles and and used it to study film. 
So uh, how do you reduce variation? How do you ask questions that are going to drive answers that you can get data out of the film that's going to be something that's going to be meaningful and contextual? And so I, I basically took that from a former career life, applied it to scouting with a process that was I was certified to learn and so that I could grow that process incrementally as I learned more about how to study football. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was a I was a fan. We were fantasy writers. I, I started in a fantasy league at my workplace. Sure. Some of the guys I worked with were at KFFL. Like you remember KFFL oh, yeah. course, like the, yeah. and their feed, right? Yeah, they were. They were part of KFFL. They were contributing to the KFFL News League. That was my first fantasy um, league. And they were like, you know, so. You know, I was pretty good at identifying rookies, so I decided, you know, it'd be kind of fun to to do this. And as the years have grown, I just made this a very transparent process that everyone could see and tried to f create a publication that's kind of a choose your own, own adventure. So mm -hmm. what I do is I show people the checklists that I use, the definitions that I use that are the criteria points in that checklist and everything scored in a yes, no fashion so that I have a very clear definition and either they did it or they didn't do it. And that way it gives me a data point that I can use with that. Um, and if I can't get a clear yes or no answer, then that means I need to redefine the question hmm. because I'm not getting enough context out of that. And either I need to either expand it into different categories or I need to break it down. So it's easy to look at this thing and go, you're insane, but I've been doing this for 20 years. When sure. the first one I did 20 years ago wasn't remotely looking mm -hmm. like this. It was very simplistic in comparison. But as I've learned more about the game, I've been able to add more to it. So I take you through how I stack rank players based on certain categories of what the position requires. I figured out that there's really two scores that I like to look at. One I use for rankings and one I use to say, how broad of their skill set can they do? Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, and then and then I give you very in-depth scouting reports that show you, you know, all the things I look at and what I observed on the field and why I think this player was good at it and wasn't good at it. Rooted again in the yes or no criteria, it's just done in narrative form. So it looks like and it is. I mean, I'm a film study guy for right. sure. Right. But all of that, all that I do is rooted in that. And then I also track things like um, I chart, I chart the passing game. I chart receiving. I chart tackles missed and tackles broken. And I'm creating data out of that because I found that sometimes the context that our that our industry does when looking at production, especially with quarterbacks. It's it's rooted in box score stats that don't drive as much context as maybe they could. Yeah. And it's a tough it's a tough thing. So what it is, is a, it's a PDF format. It's eleven hundred eighty three pages this year. It's on one hundred and fifty prospects. It looks scary and crazy to some people. Um, but when you it's all bookmarked so you can find it's like I just want to look at like like fantasy rankings. Mm. I've got that. Mm -hmm. I just I want to look at the scouting reports and read those. And just I just want to see the elevator pitch. It's like a couple paragraphs to a page, depending on the prospect. You can look at that. Or if you're the the nutso in South America who writes me on a regular basis who's studying wide receivers using my method, you can use my method and sure. knock yourself out. This episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. I know a lot of you guys already play over there, but if you don't, you definitely have to check out their best ball drafts. You draft a team, which is honestly the best part of fantasy football, and then that's it. There's no trading, no waiver wire, no lineup setting. Your roster is optimized each week based on player performance. I'm going to be doing a lot of content on best ball this season, so make sure you're signed up and ready to draft for when that content drops. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download the Underdog Fantasy app. And when you sign up, make sure you use promo code late round to get a deposit match up to $100. That's promo code late round. I love the transparency of it because I, I published, you know, the, the late round prospect guide. I started this three years ago whenever I started late round fantasy football. And one of the very most important aspects of that guide that I wanted to push forth was this is what goes into the model that I'm using. You know, I'm not trying to like hold this as this like secretive thing that no one else can access because we need that trust and transparency with the readers and the listeners. We're all doing this together in a way, right? Like this is not a, I'm better than you. I know more than you kind of thing per se. It's just that 
we're the weirdos that uh, and the, the fortunate weirdos that get to do this as, for for a living as their job and make money off of this. But uh, like we want to, you know, I I think I you know I'm speaking for you here, but we want people to be able to sort of go on the journey with us and learn with us and be part of this with us, right? One hundred percent. I mean, my wife when we first got together and I was doing this for a couple of years and maybe about four or five years later after we got married and and i i was talking about it she goes why do you share the the process i mean aren't you worried someone will take it and use it and like steal it from you and i just laughed and i said (laughs) you need to see what i do exactly Exactly. because like if (laughs) someone does what i'm doing i'm more likely to take them out for a beer and pick their brain and say hey let's talk about this because no one's going to do what i do and it's the same thing with you it's like they're going to they may do some of it but if they're in that club you have to do the work yeah and there's still a lot of work that goes behind what you show people so if you want to take some of that and do it for yourself to learn the process is about learning and and you can be comfortable about what you're putting forth because most people are just consumers who want to know more and Mm -hmm. giving them that knowledge gives them an understanding of trusting the work you do and also being able to do some of it on their own time when they have fun if yeah, exactly. Something they like to do. Exactly. And that plays directly into I, I love reading that you and I have this uh, shared, uh, I don't want to say concern, but shared uh, uh, beef against fantasy rankings, it seems like. I, I, I feel like the, the industry in general is just so rankings based when the game of fantasy is the least linear game of all time. You know, it's just yeah. th- it's just not the way that you should be looking at this stuff. And, and you know, I, I think that that's the other reason why the transparency and the process is so important is because you and I aren't necessarily selling. We're, we're definitely not selling. Hey, here's a list. Just just go run. I, I if that were the case, I could make the, the the late round prospect guide 14 pages and just be done with it. You know, uh, yeah. you know, it's important to have that that transparency, that process so that people understand why you're getting to that end result. And then they also understand that that end result is not even close to everything. But I know that you always preface everything with with uh, your, your ranking spiel, which I, I absolutely adore. I appreciate that. Yeah, I write a little I, at every beginning of every chapter just before I give the scouting profiles ranked in order i put why rankings suck but we want them anyway <laughs> yes. um and it's and i put it and I, I only probably have to say it once but i put it in there four times because i want people to kind of get the the sense of humor of, of why yes. i approach it but everything's tiered anyway mm-hmm. and so like i especially when you at this time of year when people are like you really don't like javon baker the wide receiver out of ucf you have him ranked here and i'm like Yeah, but if you look at the tiers, he's at the top of my second tier. And if you look at the score, you would go, oh, you think he's an could be an instant starter. Right. That, you know, last year he might have been number five on my list. This year he's like number 15. That's you have. It's the context that's hard because, you know, the the way that works. So for sure, it's I I I laugh because I had a feeling like um, I, I. when we were going to come on this show that we we would be fast friends on this kind of on this kind of stuff just oh, alone yeah. and and especially because you know you're a Steelers fan so uh, being a Browns fan you know it's like it's like it's like brothers who kind of jokingly war with each other anyway <laughs> yeah, right. if you if you're an NFC fan if you're an AFC North fan you're you know you, you kind of you're a special kind of breed so it's yeah a, it's yeah you have thing. that well you have that mutual respect for for the other teams in that division yeah. and the way that the, the division has gone down for years it's and years the Bengals, but you know but yeah. that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the mutual disdain for for cincinnati sure yeah um I, let, let's talk about something that i feel like finally thank god the the discussion around film versus analytics has sort of dissipated at least a little bit. Like it, I, I, I mean, you probably remember back in like the 2014, 2015 timeframe where it was, it was uh, fierce in the, in the, in the Twitter streets when it came to people sort of, uh, you know, putting people in these buckets of, Oh, you're a film guy, you're a data guy. Um, I, I'm just curious though, like what's your honest feeling? Like just, just full transparency when you see, people tweeting about, you know, this guy's yards per team pass attempt rate, this guy's yards per route run, this guy's this, this guy's that. What's your honest feeling about, not necessarily those analysts, I don't, you don't need to like, yeah. you know, dive into them as human beings, but just the, the the analysis and the process with all of that. 
Well, I mean, I would like to say bad things about Dwayne McFarland, but yeah, you know, fine. otherwise, yeah, we, we you know, that. we could we'll do that all day, you know. But uh, no, seriously, it's um for for me, it's like this: I approach everyone's work with a level of skepticism, including my own. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's really about. I think everything that gets put out there can have value and it have a layer of value. It's just about, for me, I always regard it from a skepticism of, is this good context for what we're looking for? Yeah. Is this going to give me something that I can use repeatedly? And I'd rather sit back and wait and be a little late to the party to use it and see how that's going unless I'm applying my own kind of stuff. Yep. Um, because I don't always know the context. When people show heat maps of Drake May and his and his accuracy, you know, it goes back to an argument I think that um, I had with someone on Twitter many years ago with Baker Mayfield because I wrote an, an article about how box score accuracy isn't, isn't really – is a little bit more um, deceptive than what mm -hmm. we realize. And, you know, and that created a, what turned into a, a functional or a, a, a functional argument that was a good debate more than anything else. But it was one of those things that I guess for me, I'm always looking for as much context as possible. And when people collect data, I don't always, and if I know that they're scoring it based off film or they're scoring it based off certain things, then I want to know as the, the quality person in me, I want to know like, well, how are you collecting that? Mm -hmm. And, and how are you defining what you're looking at? Because, you know, we look at accuracy, accuracy is a good reason because box score accuracy is, did they complete the pass? Right. But, you know, if you throw a pass and it's a fade route against a certain type of coverage, maybe that ball has to be thrown in a manner that the person who's making the judgment might say that was inaccurate because it was dropped or it was inaccurate because the guy had to make an adjustment that seems difficult. But if you look at the context of everything around it, you might score that as saying that was a super accurate throw mm -hmm. and it required a lot of context and very, very high end processing ability to make that determination before you even release the ball that you knew before the break that this ball was going to have to go in this spot and right. force the receiver to turn. If people aren't scoring that, then you're missing a lot of context. And I found that like with the Baker Mayfields of the world at that point, um, you know, he wasn't contextually as accurate as his box score showed, whereas Lamar Jackson was contextually far more accurate than his box scores. Showed. Right, right. And so these are the things that I'm trying to look into. And then sometimes because I can't know, I just say, well, let's just see how it bears out. Yeah. And, and it looks interesting. Um, but I'm not using it right now because yeah. I have questions about this. So yeah. that's kind of, yeah. I, I would say too, that any good data analysts should be uh, a fiend for finding that context. You know, like that, yeah. that's the thing that really frustrates me on the data side is that I, I think the, the data side is a little bit more accessible to, to the, to the ordinary Joe, if you will. Whereas, uh, you know, you have to do a lot of, 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 work to be able to not just understand film and breaking down film, but just accessing and getting all of that information. Right. And so yeah. I think, you know, you get accountants and such and people who are in finance and economics and folks who are doing whatever as their day job. And they're like, Hey, I'm going to build a model, which is great. We want more and more people to, to be involved in this and to, uh, you know, be integrated in this. The, the issue that I then have though, is because of that accessibility, I think that you then get a lot of folks who, sort of run with the wrong ideas when it comes to data. And then it gives some data analysts a, a bad name, right? I mean, there's yeah. th there's a very like, th there's a, definitely a subset of people who are just insanely strict with the way that they analyze data in this like very binary way when we know that football is a completely, especially scouting, just a completely gray area endeavor, right? Like we're, we're trying to figure out how these guys are going to transfer from college to pros from all these different yeah. programs, from all these different schemes and all these different situations. Uh, and then not only that, we haven't even gotten into the fact that there, you know, all these people come from different backgrounds and they have different ways of, uh, from a work ethic standpoint. I and mean, there's just so much to this to then say, this guy's bad because he didn't declare early. That's, 
that's that's gonna that, that's just not to me yeah. the proper way to approach this thing. I think it's more so finding that context and being a little bit more open minded and saying, you know, I always tell people with my prospect guide, especially and like my model and stuff, this is just a guide. This is not this is not like I'm not going to look at this score of Adonai Mitchell and say, you absolutely need to rank this guy right here. I know through testing that the model is uh, a more predictive of, of a player's first three years in the league than rookie ADP is, for instance, just by testing that. But I think there are still ways to be even better and, and, and far more better and to, to, to spot, you know, there's, there's certainly blind spots with the model itself, which I'm sure we'll dig into as we talk about these guys. But I, I totally agree that, uh, you know, the, the, the context piece is just very, very important, as is the, the strictness in the way that you're sort of approaching, you know, your own analysis. And, and films the same way, because, I mean, there are quarterbacks, former quarterbacks who are scoring quarterbacks. And I look at some of the things that they have to say, and some of them are very educational. I would shout out, you know, JT O'Sullivan yes. um, as a good example of someone who does that kind of work. And he and I both contributed to our work to a quarterback coach who's Will Hewlett, who's worked with uh, Brock Purdy pre-draft, worked with Anthony Richardson pre-draft, has done a little work with Caleb Williams this year. So, you know, I, I, it, he's educational about the game. But there are also some quarterbacks I'm not going to mention because it's, sure. you know, it's part yeah. of the process of learning. We all have our flaws who may be so strict about identifying coverage. They're like grammarians who may just don't know how to write like yeah. in a manner that's compelling, yeah. you know. So, yeah. you know, there's a little bit of that that goes on even from the film side of this equation where you don't know the context of. And it's, it's the same thing. I look at scouting reports and go, how do I parse like what Lance Zerline and Dane Brugler do with what you do. Right. And I go, unless we sat down like you and I are going to sit down for the next 90 minutes right. and have this conversation uh, strictly about how we would do that, and it would probably take more than 90 minutes to oh, parse yeah. all that out, there's no way I know. All I can say is I respect the work that they put into the product that they do and that, they, that they're continually trying to learn. And I have no earthly idea why they arrive at some conclusions any more than they have any earthly idea why <laughs> right. I do, right. uh, even if I put my process out there, because I know they're spending time studying film. They're not studying my process. Of course. Why would they? You right. know, so, so yeah, so it's a, it's, it's really from both sides of that, um, of that aisle where it's, it is about, you know, you, you want to follow your compass and it's the only way you're going to learn more and be able to provide more value to other people is when you mess up on players and you go back and look and, and, or you mess up on something that's repeated and you go, okay, I need to refine this area of what I'm looking at. Yeah. And, and that delivers the good results. I mean, when, when, you know, I always, I always joke because people say, Oh, you you had Kareem, you had Hakeem Butler number one overall as a wide receiver like seven years ago, and I'm yeah. like, yeah, I did. <laughs> I said, but it also helped me learn, you know, to be ahead of the game on guys like AJ Brown, Justin Jefferson, you know, Jamar Chase, Jalen, Jaden Reed, you know, a bunch of people, yeah, you know, that if I hadn't have stuck with what I did and figured out, okay, why am I doing this off? instead of looking at what somebody else said and mm -hmm. not knowing what went on behind it, I wouldn't have come up with things that help me provide insights that may have either been somewhat unique to totally unique, you, you know? On that yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You're also in the wrong business if you're expecting perfection, right? <laughs> Out of this stuff. <laughs> It's like it's like saying it's like being in a dunking booth and saying, I want to be in a place where I'm always dry. Yeah, you know? right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it, it's it's bound to happen. It's going to happen. Um, let's let's get our hands dirty, though, a little bit. Let's talk yeah. about this class, because I, I mean, it's intriguing. I think at, at every position, every fantasy relevant position, the quarterback one. Now, I don't have. I don't prospect quarterbacks in much detail. I'm, I've been working on some stuff, but it's just a hard position to figure out, especially Too analytically. Too many variables. Yeah, it's there's right now. Yeah. so much, so much. So I'm not, I'm not the kind of person that just kind of throws stuff out there just for the sake of throwing it out there. I want it to be good, and I want to feel good about that thing. So I haven't thrown out a quarterback model in my in my history. So let's talk about quarterback. It feels like. The majority of people see a big three, maybe a big four. Now that JJ McCarthy has gotten the steam that he's gotten, but your process seems to like Michael Penix and Bo Nix a little bit more than the other guys. Now I don't necessarily want to dig in. I mean, we have you know limited time here. Yeah. I don't want to dig into those guys per se. 
One guy I do really want to dig into, though, is someone that you seem a, a bit lower on, and that's Drake May. So what does your analysis say about him, and, and what are the reasons as to why he's sort of pushed down a little bit? Sure, because, you know, for me, my scale's on 0 to 100. I try to make it intuitive. Anything over 90 is a instant, like, production leader star yeah. entering the league. That's how talented that guy is. Very rarely, I don't think I've ever had a quarterback hit that number. Um, <laughs> you know, 80 to... 80 to 85 is anything over 85 is like they're an instant starter. They're a guy who I think can learn quickly on the go and they could probably withstand like the withstand, you know, the, the, the child owner basically th forcing that guy into the coach's scheme, even yeah. though the coach didn't want it. So Caleb Williams is kind of almost childproof, you know, yeah. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Drake may to me is more at, I think a 76, which means He's on the cusp of being a reserve who you could see growth potential with his game in the next two to three years to become a starter. If you believe that the NFL has any idea about how to evaluate quarterback, I mean, evaluate and sponsor a developmental scenario where these guys can develop themselves because that's really what happens. Mm -hmm. And we know that that doesn't happen. <laughs> we know that that's an indictment against the NFL. So Drake May, to me, I can see why people like him as a potential starter. But when you study his accuracy, when you chart plays, and what I'm looking for is pinpoint accuracy based on the things we talked about earlier, you know, as an example of why heat maps don't work for me, and I want more context than that. He he struggles with accuracy that is a, a more contextual look than box score accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, so I have issues with that. I have quarterback is a processing decision. Um, position it's a performance position and i think people look a lot as from a science uh, from a science intellectual approach which i understand because it does require rote memory and but it also requires integrating a lot of information all at once and using all these different physical conceptual and intellectual and emotional skill sets to fuse it into one salient solution and it's got to be done like in less than 2.5 seconds. Yeah. So it's like, I, I joke that it's like stand-up comedy, you know, like you can have theory of being on a stage and how to perform and how to hold yourself, how to deliver a line. You got to have the timing. You also have to have good material. You got to respond to the audience or choose when not to respond to the audience or whatever crazy things happen. And, you know, Alex Smith to me was an example of a player who, who was like, you know, the had wrote really smart comedy, but it was so intellectual, maybe that maybe you needed a laugh track to like goad you into laughing, <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know? Yeah. And whereas Brett Favre on the other end of the spectrum told nothing but Larry, the cable guy fart jokes, but yeah, because yeah, he could, yeah. his timing was amazing and he could, he could riff with an audience and he had that ability, that ability to process fast that he could tell the most crass jokes and you're laughing even if you don't want to. Yeah. And you might even be crying you're laughing so hard sometimes. And then sometimes he'd bomb unbelievably. But right. you, count how many bad jokes Bill Burr has. So, you know, <laughs> he's great. But he, he if you count out, if you started counting how many jokes a comedian had that were bad, you'd probably stop watching stand-up comedy, True. even though yeah. even though there's some points you you love the comedian. So with Drake May. He's that guy that his decision making seems to be a beat or two late compared to NFL caliber quarterbacks. And that's an ingrained skill to like when you're integrating information and delivering in that with that timing and that confidence, that's an ingrained skill that it's got to. I think it, in this environment, more often than not, it has to be there. Or else you need a lot of time to sit and wait and maybe get what Jordan Love got, which mm. is time to really like that intermittent starting, like the old timey Chuck right. Noll, Terry Bradshaw. We're going to bench you. We're going to bring you back in. We're going to bench you. They're going to hang your 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 image in effigy at Three Rivers. We're right. going to bring you back in. You're going to win four Super Bowls. Yeah. You know, but it's like you know him, Steve McNair. You know, Drew Brees got that from Marty Schottenheimer. Aaron Rodgers essentially got that Patrick Mahomes essentially got yeah. that you know so you he needs that kind of time because he doesn't make great decisions in the red zone he doesn't make he sees things pre-snap and then looks away from them and not to manipulate 
He just doesn't want to take the easy solutions. So there's a lot of little things. And then when you add on to some footwork issues that can be um, addressed, but when you have all these conceptual issues that are problematic, it slows your game down and it causes you to question things and do things incorrectly that you already had down. Because if you've ever been on stage and you've practiced things and somebody says, you've nailed this, all this is great. But then suddenly you have to think about something that's more advanced. Mm -hmm. The things that you had nailed, now you look like you're starting all over again. Yeah. And that's why what happens with quarterbacks. And that's why May to me is he's he's the robo quarterback who came out of central casting. But the things that actually matter that we're learning, like processing speed and, and accuracy and confidence of decision making um, and reading defenses and being on time, they're not there yet. Yeah. So knowing that about May, how much and I, I hate when people ask me how much because we don't know, like it's just hard to quantify a percentage or something like that. But so clearly teams aren't doing what you're advising them to do, which is sort of give them a little time and let them let them chill out for a little bit and, and understand the game a little bit better, maybe from the sidelines for a second. Uh, I would imagine that anyone going in the top three or four in this class, let's say someone trades up into that four spot is going to probably play almost immediately, if not immediately, right? And so yeah. if if May does go, which I think we would probably bet on that at this point, in the top three or four of this draft, um, are you then extremely concerned, especially if he goes to a place like New England where the structure and the stability isn't there from like a pass-catching standpoint? Like, does uh, basically what I'm asking you is, uh, does landing spot really, really make you fearful more so with a guy like Drake May than maybe someone else in this class? Absolutely. Like if he were in New England, I'd feel that he's a little more radioactive for fantasy GMs, at least from my perspective, yeah. unless for some reason they do some like Hollywood-esque trading around somehow yeah. or like steal somebody, some people off of teams and nobody notices because it's they don't have <laughs> offensive. The offensive line's OK. The running game's pretty good, um, but they don't have the receiving talent. Now, yeah. if he went to Minnesota, you might look at that and say, He's got the receiving talent. Exactly. The offensive line's questionable. I'm still, I'd still feel the way I feel about him now. Like, okay, I can see it, but yeah. it's still, there's risks. If I look at New England, I'm like, yeah, no effing way. I'm <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not only that, at least in Minnesota, we have a, a, a coaching structure and scheme that we've seen, you know, other quarterbacks be able to produce in where there's just a lot of ambiguity in new England right now, right? Like we just don't know exactly how that's going to go down up there. So uh, yeah, I totally, totally get that. Another quarterback that is sort of in that range being mocked slash reported strongly that he'll be going number two to Washington is Jaden Daniels. Uh, my question about Daniels is less about sort of who he is as a quarterback, which you can definitely dig into, but yeah. you know, is this a, an archetype that really can Lamar Jackson esque break fantasy football? Um, no, I would say he is more of a Marcus Mariota archetype mm, who could okay. be bet what people hoped Marcus Mariota would be, but with a little more realistic expectations. Because the Marcus Mariota archetype is also probably the Robert Griffin archetype, mm -hmm. um, which is straight line runner, um, okay in the pocket, but not great, um, big arm, and the ability to, to throw it deep. Now, there's a, there are some people out there that we respect in the industry, like Greg Cosell, I believe, is one of them, says he's a better processor than people expect. And, you know, I've talked to Greg. I know Greg. He's, you know, at least I know him well enough to have had conversations with him, and he's a great guy, and, and, and I have uh, a credit to what we do. I would disagree with him about the processing part, only from the standpoint of that, I believe that he can look to three receivers and look across the field and make successful reads like that. But where I have issues with him as a processor is that he tends to rush his processing. And mm -hmm. so he has this tragic comic timing of where like he'll see a coverage of a certain type of zone coverages where he has maybe an, a deep over route or an intermediate route that's going to break um, between those defenders. And just as he should wait another beat and there's plenty of time, like he bought himself a lot of time to do it, he could make one more hitch and that ball could come out. Instead, he makes one more hitch and then turns and runs in the out and away just as the route's breaking open. And I saw this repeatedly with him. And so, and then on top of it, it does look like he was told one or two reads and, and, and run a yeah. lot, you yeah. know, so he's capable of more, but 
he also has some issues with it. So I like him in Washington. I think that it would be um, something where they could create a good system around him with a, a lot of the a talent that they have at wide receiver. They have a decent running game. So there's there's reason to like what he is uh, or what he can become. But I think like a Mariota or a Robert Griffin, I think he will need some training wheels to kind of scheme things open for him where he's not manipulating as much as he's executing and the rest of the offense is manipulating with misdirection to create open opportunities for him. And with his athletic ability as a thrower and as a runner, he can exploit that. But eventually the bill's going to come due because defenses are going to go, we know this play. We know all the variations in which you're going to try and run this play. And we're going to shut this stuff down and we're going to make you throw the deep out or the deep comeback here against, you know, this type of a coverage with a robber here or whatever. And you're going to have to show us that you can do it while we're putting the, the, the pressure to you from bookends and keeping you inside the pocket. You know, can you do that? And if you can, now, now we're looking at Lamar Jackson, right. who was actually showed that in Baltimore year one. But the but the Ravens, I think Ozzie Newsom knew what he had, and I think the executives at the Ravens said, "We're gonna put some training wheels around this guy because we don't quite trust what Ozzie saw, and he's leaving, and we're gonna we're gonna like." slow roll Jackson to the point that Jackson's kind of like had to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt yeah. that like, look guys, you delayed my development by like two years, you <laughs> yeah. know, let's, yeah. let's, let's get real. I played in a pro style offense. Can we do this? And I think Jaden Daniels is more of what the Ravens feared they had with Jackson mm. as to the reality of what they got. Um, so that's the difference. Still can be a good quarterback, but there's still there's more landmines than the perception they had over Jackson. Yeah. Do you do you think that the the mobility, the rushing? I mean, look, Lamar Jackson is arguably probably the most prolific rusher that we I mean, even more than Vic, arguably. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. And so so I don't want to be that guy. Right. And just like making that sort of I think it's just stupid and lazy, whatever. But just from like a rushing production standpoint, you know, and, and what you see, I mean, what I've seen, too, is it, it, Lamar Jackson's always been very intelligent with his rushing, right? And, and yes. Jaden Daniels just seems a little more careless with with the way that he's he goes about. Yeah. I mean, there's 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 there's, a, there's those clips that always get shared around Twitter where he just gets yeah. smoked after like he just yeah. doesn't care. Uh, but regardless of all that, like, do you see an outcome or a path where Daniels could be, you know, a, an 800 plus yard rushing quarterback in the league, or is it going to be more of like what you said with like a Mariota type? I think he can be, you know, I mean, we look at Robert Griffin and I think he was someone that fit that that yeah. spectrum for at least one year. Yeah. I think that Daniels has that opportunity to have that peak. I'm just a little bit, I want to see more proof that he's a little smarter or wiser about his running yeah. so that it's not just a one-year deal. Yeah. That's my concern is that like he runs into he runs into the brick wall and then we never see that again because he's injured. And, you know, again, we can't, predict injury but sure. he is careless to the point that whereas lamar jackson rarely gets touched and runs out of bounds and gains and moves the chains i'm afraid that he's going to make that extra effort to move the chain by a yard and wind up getting concussed a few times or yeah. messing up a, a leg so i would say 500 to 700 yards yeah. absolutely yeah 800 plus yards more than once i'm doubtful yeah. Okay. That's fair. Very fair. Let's move yeah. on to the running back position. This is one that I do look at analytically in a lot of detail. Uh, just, you know, 10,000 foot view. Are you looking at this class as it's just bad all around? Or are you looking at this as uh, what others believe and what I believe that it's not that bad of a class. It's just that we don't have this like obvious elite talent at the top. Yeah, I would say it's an amorphous blob. And that's a thing that I hate to say <laughs> as someone who's supposed to make these kind of decisions. And as a guy who has kind of developed the reputation before anything else that I did as a running back guy. Mm. Um, so I really like Jonathan Brooks. Um, but the injury has a lot of question marks that I are understandable. I'm going to hedge my bet and say, yeah, he's the top guy. And I would have yeah. put him among the top two players last year which a lot mm-hmm. of people might not have done but i would have put him ahead of jameer gibbs as a talent mm-hmm. now landing spot dictates a lot so right. that said um 
I don't think it's a bad class. I just think that people forget that if you look at the average number of running backs who actually provide substantial production that we look at for fantasy using as the equivalent, it's plus or minus one running back out of like three being good, two yeah. being average, and one being bad. So right. I, I look at this class. There, edit, there's there's 12 guys between number two and number 12 on my board that if they get the right landing spot yep. and they – they advance quickly in just one or two areas. They could be the number two back in terms of talent and production value. Yeah. So it's a good, it's actually a good class in the sense of this draft because quarterback's going to be intriguing. People are going to want to take those off the board. Wide receiver is great in terms of what we look at for pre draft. So they're going to be the priority. And that means that there's going to be a lot of potential value that you don't have to take a lot of high risk yeah. on after round th two like round three on is like pick a running back because yeah. you're going to be able to get a decent opportunity at one at least pre-draft and then post-draft you can be a little more selective about who where the values are going to lie yeah look I, I say this all the time on the show but fantasy football the fantasy football landscape and this is obviously transferable to the nfl to some degree there's like seven RB ones in football right now, like guys that, you know, that you can just confidently get elite production from. And then the RB, you know, RB two, we always say RB two as like RB 13 to RB 24, but realistically RB two is like RB eight to RB 40, you know, like there's, right. there's just this massive range of guys who in yeah. the right spot, in the right environment, we're going to be able to see some spiked weeks and some spiked performances. Like, look at what Rashad White did last year. I, I, you know, I liked Rashad White as a prospect. I thought that last year he was a, a pretty good get in value and all that good, good stuff. But I don't think that we would ever look at Rashad White and say this is the same kind of talent at, and and he has the same kind of uh, athleticism as a, a Brees Hall or a B. John Robinson or something like that, you know. But right. but we can still get that spike season out of that player. I think we're bound to see that from guys in this class too. It's just that there's good wide receivers, which we'll get to in a second, and I think that's going to push down costs, as you said. I had Noah Hills uh, on the show earlier this sure. week, and he he gave you a couple shouts uh, on that yeah. show. Thought it was a good like preface for you coming on perspectives later in the week. Um, but one of the things that I brought up to him and talked to him about, I'm curious with your own process and the way that you're sort of evaluating these guys. This running back class has an insane amount of of olds, if you will. I mean, there's there's just and, and look, this is not necessarily uh, you know these guys' faults. I mean, there was the pandemic. There yeah. were, are changes to NIL. There's changes to transfer rules, which I think is also very, very big and why we're going to get fewer early declare players and you know maybe more uh, of the elderly types. But uh, I say elderly. These guys are 24 years old. Uh, I know, right? But, I mean, I'm <laughs> what like, I'd give to lose 30 yeah, years right, right now. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So we have these guys. But, but I'm, I'm curious if while you're evaluating them, if you care at all about the age and that number because right now you could look at a guy like ray davis versus one of the younger guys in the class and you're looking at a three and a half to four year age gap between yeah. you know the youngest guy in the class to a guy like ray davis um but or, or you know do you do you care about that or if are you looking at this as you know if this guy can ball he can ball yeah it's a it's a great question obviously i do a post-draft analysis that comes with the pre-draft so I, it's the pre-draft I like to make is it's like evergreen. We're scouting these players. And I promise you, all you people who ask me, you want to buy the post-draft and separately, I always tell them, look, wait a couple of years and you're going to look back and you're going to value the pre-draft more because it's just an, an unadulterated look at talent. So when right. these, these guys come off the waiver wire, especially running backs that your league mates never heard of, you're going to have the full scoop on these guys and you're going to know what system they fit on well and which ones they didn't. Whereas the post draft though, I can account for things like, well, he's a little older, you know, all the fan things that fan, not only fantasy cares about, but maybe the NFL cares about yeah. too. Now the pre-draft part of me, which is what I like the most is I shake my fist at all that and say, <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. Like I, I don't care. I like talent. And 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 running back is a processing position because as as um, Rick Spielman, the former GM of the the Vikings, said a few years ago on the Ringer podcast, is like you know what we're learning about processing is that the closer you are to the middle of the field, the more information you have to process. And processing again is not just an instinctive thing; it's actually if you really parse it down, it's the it's the integration of all the the you know the physical, the intellectual, the technical um, aspects to deliver a solution at the speed of instinct. Mm. You know, it's like 
performance musicians. You know, you learn all your scales, you learn all your theory, you, you learn how to play with other people, and then you try to learn how, then you practice improvising. But you're mm -hmm. taking all these complex things that you've never, maybe you've never even done some of these things in combination before, given, because you've never seen that situation before. But the more situations you see, the easier it is for you to deliver these things in a cogent, entertaining manner. And running back is the same way. And I think that, you know, a lot of people see it as they're, you know, the same way I always joke and, and it gets some charged, some people charged up when I say it, but I always joke like it's like jazz musicians and somebody go that Louis Armstrong, he just, he's just a black man who had a, had a gift from God. And those black people just had a gift for being able to play that improvisational music <laughs> right. as opposed to all the training that he actually, right, did, right, yeah. you know, that right. to get there, you know, and you still heard that back, even like you still even hear that within the past five years, sometimes out of players without the racial sure. aspect of it. But the, so my point being is that, because it's not a maturity thing, it's how well things get ingrained. I don't care how old you are mm -hmm. because it's really it's really about how well your unschooled and and structured way of creating these skill sets to deliver instinctively at, at the speed of instinct are, are put together. So mileage doesn't matter to me. It shows, you know, people always say, well, age, they've had a lot more playing time but you look at guys like cedric benson to ray rice adrian yeah. peterson ricky williams and guys who can carry the ball at a high volume in the college game tend to do the same thing in the pro game yeah. so age doesn't concern me unless the nfl is concerned by it and we see that by draft capital yeah right and i would argue that if we see it by draft capital or if you know we we generally know that the fantasy industry probably leans more analytical when they're drafting these rookies and such. Just be, like yeah. I talked about earlier, there's just more people that are sort of analyzing things in that manner that uh, it's probably embedded in, in in rookie draft capital as well in some way, in ADP, right? Like it, like Ray Davis being 24 and a half years old at draft time, uh, he's probably not going to be a second round rookie pick in, in any kind of format, more than likely, yeah. you know? And so, um, you know, that, you know, whether it's because of his talent or his age, uh, I think it's probably going to be embedded in that in some way. So you might not, you know, if you're just only looking at some aspects or some inputs, you might not have to like overemphasize the age thing, um, you know, and, and uh, because usually it'll be captured in some way. Now, I do want to talk about some individual running backs because, again, like I said, you go deeper on this stuff and talking about prospects and looking at prospects than probably anyone on on planet Earth, uh, just just given the the number of guys that are in RSP. Um, but the guys I'm going to ask you are, are, are players that were at the combine guys that I looked at as well. And so I really want to pick your brain about it. One guy that you seem to be a little bit higher on, and I've seen some of your analysis on this, but talk to me about Dylan Johnson, man. Cause he's had, you know, he, he had sort of that, uh, when I was looking at his analytical profile, again, context important. Uh, I'm like, man, he had a couple seasons where he was catching the ball a lot. And then I'm like, oh, he played under Mike Leach. That makes a lot of sense. He's catching the ball a lot when he's playing under Mike Leach. And then obviously he he transfers and he uh, does his thing. Bigger bodied guy uh, seems like a pretty intelligent runner. But what do you what do you feel? Because I feel like he's just an afterthought right now, wh whether you're talking uh, fantasy space or just other scouts out there. But you seem to like him uh, more than most. So what do you like about him? Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm I joke that um good for good or for bad i'm you know we have imprinting on us in terms of certain types of players we like as scouts. Oh, yeah. oh, that's yeah. just how it is like just like you you have certain types of people that you're attracted to in your in your life you, you know and it's usually whatever early influences that were that way for me for good or for bad i like backs who the midpoint good or bad would land towards spencer Ware. Uh, you know, if you think about <laughs> if you think about Spencer Ware, he'd run through you, run over you. He could run around you, but he just wasn't very fast. But he yeah, could yeah. do a little bit of everything. Yeah. And there, and he could, if you get him in the right environment, he could have some awesome moments. And analytically, it looked great. But then it's like, well, we found somebody who's a better athlete, younger, and Kareem <laughs> yeah. Hunt, who we we put more draft capital in. You know, so that's my midpoint guy. When and when I look at Dylan Johnson, he's a smart runner with great footwork who really understands how to process the game quickly, both as an inside and outside runner. Um, he has just enough burst to be able to get through the line and get into the second level and break tackles, and he breaks all sorts of tackles. When I track, you know, I track tackles not just by whether 
you know, somebody slapped Saquon Barkley's thigh pad, but yeah. whether or not, you know, a defensive tackle hit Nick Chubb in the chest and he still gained three yards after that as opposed – that's more valuable to me than Saquon Barkley getting 70 off of a fly swat. Right. Um, you know, as good as Barkley can be. Um, so when I look at Dylan Johnson, he go, he pulls through reaches, wraps, and hits, and he often does it on, on it, it, within the same touch. Um, which is even more valuable. That shows you the kind of real true power and contact balance he has. Um, so I see a smart runner who can do a lot of everything, including pass, protect, and catch. And those guys tend to get pushed down if they're not very fast. Um, right. And they, but they end up outlasting the guys who are speedy, who aren't as good. Like say, Jalen Warren. And Anthony McFarlane, if I'm mm. going to use a Steelers reference, you know, as an example, you know, or, you know, or Peyton Barber and the litany of backs that were in Tampa who were drafted above him that he outlasted, I think, five guys to end up being a starter for a cup of time. Now, fantasy people are going to go, who cares about Peyton Barber? Sure. You know, but he is one of those RB8 to RB40s that can have spike games. Yeah. Yeah. that you want to know about. So Dylan Johnson to me is one of those guys that if he's faster than people realize, because again, he played hurt all last year and was to an ankle injury, a lingering knee injury, actually two ankle injuries and played well through that um, and has all those things in his toolbox. And maybe he's a little faster because maybe he had to push it to participate and knew he had to, and he wasn't completely as fast or he's just processes fast enough on tape that he, he shows up well because Arian Foster, we know, wasn't exa- exactly a, a burner mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. If he can show, if he and he reminds me a little bit of that, yeah. he can be that. Then he could be a big surprise. And for me, that's what I like doing with pre-draft because it's like I show you unadulterated. I had Isaiah Crowell as RB one once. Mm-hmm. Y- you know, I had um, Isaiah Pacheco. Yeah, I you, think you, you, and I were both big, big Pacheco big, folks. Like, we, yeah. we should actually let's just spend the next forty minutes talking about Isaiah Pacheco <laughs> and how right we were about Isaiah Pacheco. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that's but that's context for you because I'm sure you yeah. saw similar things or when you look at his play. You know, for me, one of the big differentiators was like. Well, he doesn't have great vision. I thought, well, when I looked at it, he'd run gap plays and his and his puller wasn't athletic enough to even get to the hole. Right. So right. if it's a if it's like hit one hole meet and that's the only decision you have and your one decision is screwed from the beginning, um, yeah. how are you gonna put that on him? He's gonna NFL's gonna be easier for him as yeah. a decision maker than it was. A, at a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Pacheco thing for me was I'm always a sucker for bigger body guys who have that athleticism. I'm look, I'm not, I'm not a sucker for athleticism the way that some folks are and, sure. you know, from an analytics perspective, but obviously that speed score was unbelievable. And he had that, that crazy yeah. weight adjusted 40 time, but also again, talking about context, no, few people were giving the Rutgers offense enough context with Pacheco and that horrific offensive line that he was working under and looking at efficiency above volume and above the fact that his receiving numbers were act- like they were actually using him a decent bit as a receiver and when you get the combination of size speed receiving that's something that i'm definitely a sucker for is is, is just like looking at that no i'm not saying that but you know a, a guy with an okay you know, moderate or above average receiving profile to a, an elite receiving profile that doesn't mean that i think he's gonna be a pass catcher at the next level it's just an intent thing right it, it's a team yeah. saying we're using this guy in this way and that's a signal for, oh, maybe that guy, you know, could be uh, something. And that was the case with Pacheco. With Dylan Johnson, you were saying all of that. The the ending of my blurb for him in the prospect guide uh, says, could he come through in fantasy as more of a handcuff type? Probably. He can play all three downs realistically. He just doesn't appear to be special, right? Like right. It's, it's this aspect where I could see him being a three down back in a, you know, like, why can't he step in for someone who either, you know, like the, the Peyton Barber example is actually a really good example of just like that sort of, archetype that kind of player that you can have him on your taxi you can have him on your bench in dynasty and just kind of see what happens and uh you know kind of go from there he at least has the size to be able to be that guy and and for me i you know from my perspective and you know i I certainly can be wrong with guys because you know for me trey sermon fits into that archetype and certainly if you look at i had him ranked number one in that class you know and Mm -hmm. he wound up on a team that valued speed a lot right, more right. Um, and it didn't work out for him, you know? And so now he's a reserve and he doesn't look as fast. But the thing is, is that, you know, for me, it's, it's one of those things where a guy like Dylan Johnson 
we're going to see how fast he plays because it's really about how fast you play. And I, and, and it, because it's a processing position, I think that the NFL sometimes can also be behind the curve. Mm. I'm realizing that because if there are all the former people coming out of there recently say it's an instinctive position, then yeah, they're a little bit behind on that. And I would, you know, uh, you know, just going back to the analytics part, you know, one of my longtime subscribers worked as an analytics um, professional. He was a scout, but also has a master's in stats and master's in biomechanics and worked for 30 different GMs um, on his own uh, deals to work with teams. And he delivered analytics and scouting info. So I always, you know, when there's things, I, I'll ask him things. The joke is I actually, Dwayne wanted to work with me. And I actually asked him, I said, can you have a conversation with this guy and just see <laughs> whether or not I should like have a, a bigger conversation with Dwayne, just because you're going to be able to have conversations and say, am I going to like, am I going to be putting him in a situation where it's going to look bad on me, like in two yeah. or three years because of you know, this? And he's like, no, this guy's good. But like yeah. the point being with this guy is that when we look at players like this, we'll, he'll often talk, send little comments to me and go, listen, man, like the way you evaluate positions and the way you evaluate stuff is light years ahead of what the NFL is doing. I'm not saying you're a better scout than 28 sure. veter year veterans or things like that. Cause, but he said, but the what, reason I subscribe is that you look at, you tug the strings that need to be tugged yeah. and ask the questions that need to be asked that we don't see a lot. And I think that's what you do in this space and other people who do a maybe more blatantly analytic approach yeah. do that the NFL has to get going. And so with the running back position, we have to both look as serving an audience. We look at a Dylan Johnson and yours is dead on because it's, it basically says, you know, here's the reality of what likely is going to happen, but here's what he can provide value for if that reality um, happens. And for me, I like to do it in two parts. Here's me saying, you know, to, to the NFL <laughs> and to everybody else with what I believe is right. And then here's the post draft to say, OK, yeah. and even in the pre-draft, I give you the real. I go, OK, look, he's yeah. not I'm not saying you should draft him fifth among your running backs on your board. I'm saying I think his talent is worthy of that. If, and if he lands in the right situation, he could be a really good value. But realistically, it's probably not going to happen. This episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. I know a lot of you guys already play over there, but if you don't, you definitely have to check out their best ball drafts. You draft a team, which is honestly the best part of fantasy football, and then that's it. There's no trading, no waiver wire, no lineup setting. Your roster is optimized each week based on player performance. I'm gonna be doing a lot of content on best ball this season, so make sure you're signed up and ready to draft for when that content drops. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download the Underdog Fantasy app. And when you sign up, Make sure you use promo code late round to get a deposit match up to $100. That's promo code late round. Another guy that you seem to like, and I love seeing this because I feel like not a lot of people are, or not enough people are talking about Kamani Vidal and, and what he can provide kind of a smaller, but thick back. I mean, he's got, he's got enough size to him. He has a really interesting speed profile too. Uh, what do you like about him? I mean, you know, it's for fantasy getting on the field. A lot of it's pass pro, mm. you know, if you can, if you can pass protect that, they're going to trust you enough to use you in a variety of situations. And that gives you more opportunities to get on the field, even as a situational guy and then prove your worth from there. Vidal is probably one of the three to four best pass protectors I saw technique wise and, and the type of, then the size of defenders that he can handle. So, if, you know, it's one thing to pick up a, a, blitzing safety from like 15 yards away sure. it's another to be able to pick up a tackle on a twist yeah. you, you know and do it well enough that your quarterback should have gotten rid of the ball yeah you know that's those are things he can do and then on top of it you know the like you said l low center of gravity fast quick good footwork understands how to set up creases um deals with unanticipated um, situations well. I joke that, you know, a couple years ago, our community saw DeAndre Swift as a potential star in some corners, you know, where he was like really more complicated, really a, a good NFL running back who can produce like a star, 
than that RB8 to RB40 range who needs some real circumstances to maximize those skill sets. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Jalen Hurts taking up two to three defenders in a box so that you have that three to one box advantage, you know, to run between the tackles well or in Detroit used as the volume guy. Well, to me, if you people, the way people were seeing and worshiping DeAndre Swift to an extent is really they were looking into Kamani Padal's potential future as a runner if he gets the right opportunity based on whatever draft capital happens with him because he's not, you know, the NFL does like to cover their assets with bullet points like school, production, you know, and those things are important to them. And Troy is not exactly the, you know, yeah. the center of the heat map, you hot know, bed, even yeah. in the hotbed of, of things. So I like him a lot. But, you know, we're, we're going to have to see where he gets drafted. And even still, he could be the Isaiah Pacheco of this class yeah. in ter- if that situation arises. Yeah, uh, I almost feel obligated to do this because I uh, he's he's been a really tough evaluation for me analytically. And I feel like it's the same way for folks who are looking at things from a process standpoint with film as Braylon with, with Braylon Allen. Um, you know, I have. I have a metric called breakout score that I developed this off season where it's age adjusted production and it's a production metric that's based on total yards per team play, which is one of the better ones at running back. And Braylon Allen has the best breakout score in the class, which shouldn't be that big of a surprise because he was 17 years old playing at Wisconsin after being recruited as a, as a sort of defensive back, maybe linebacker type hybrid type player. But the fact that he then went to Wisconsin, which is no, I mean, we've seen a lot of good running backs come out of Wisconsin over the years. Goes to Wisconsin. He's 17 years old. He produces as a freshman. And then you look at his production profile and some of the more advanced metrics, and things didn't get that much better for Braylon Allen as his Wisconsin career went on. And then you look at sort of his, uh, and I'm curious about what your uh, charting looks like for him with his missed tackles for stuff, because it didn't look that good when I'm looking at like PFF and such and these other sites that are uh, attempting to do that as well. And so it's this bigger bodied back. He's got this AJ Dillon like size, but is he using that size to the proper advantage that he should be? And, you know, is, is there concern there that he's just not, uh, you know, the, 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 the right back for that frame almost. Yeah. He's a, he was a difficult evaluation because, you know, on the surface, you could joke that like you watch some of his tape, and it would be the equivalent of like someone serving you a sandwich that turns out to be a turd sandwich. But then you let go. That lettuce was really, you know, I picked the lettuce out of there and it was really fresh looking, but I don't want to have anything to do with the sandwich. And then you order, you know, let's look at another play. All right. Another sandwich comes down the line. Same thing. But now it's like the meat was good, but yeah. looks good. But uh, nope, still a turd in the sandwich. So his game wasn't integrated on the level that it should be because there were multiple moments where you see elements of his game that look good footwork, you know, certain decision-making skills, the speed in, in this, when he gets into the secondary, but the power specifically, you know, the thing is, is what makes this most difficult is to the letter of my scoring. He did an elite job of breaking tackles. Um, He was in the elite tier the way I define it. But, you know, Derrick Henry's in the elite tier of breaking tackles. But would you put Derrick Henry on the same tier as Earl Campbell? Like, right. are is that, that that's like, you, you know, it's like being on Beverly Hills and you, you know, living on Beverly Hills and you live in a shotgun house. <laughs> and then like down the street, you, you have like some Hollywood producers like Castle. You know, you you know, that's kind of where Braylon Allen is right now. He could get further down that road. But the problem is, is that because he breaks multiple wraps and and bounces off a hit or a wrap and does it within the same play, he can do that. Um, He can break tackles at the line of scrimmage. But what you often see also is the other end of the spectrum where his hips and his pads aren't aligned when he's making contact. And what he's trying to do is be that slick, um, you know, quick back who can drop his pads and turn his hips away and run away. He's trying to get away rather than he is trying to run over a guy. And it usually comes to bite him when he's facing a defender who is his size or larger. 
Um, and when he does that, it's the expectation versus the reality. The reality is, is that he's a good tackle breaker, um, may, actually a very good tackle breaker for most of what you'd expect from a running back. But from what we've seen he could do and what he should do, yeah. he's he's disappointing. And right. I think that that drives some of the narrative and also makes it a more difficult evaluation because when you define it by the letter of what you want to see, it's happening on one level and then in a different way that you define it, it's not happening yeah. and should be happening. Yeah. So he's that guy to me that, yeah, if, if he winds up with Jim Harbaugh in, with the Chargers and they give him that nice runway on gap plays and he gets to the second level, he can be a 1400 yard rusher with 10 right. touchdowns. If you put him in a, if you put him in an offense where you ask him to run from a variety of different looks and he's getting some time and not he's getting intermittent time. He might be really inconsistent and never really make as much of a dent as you would hope. Yeah. I've been kind of approaching it as I'm going to let uh, uh landing spot and draft capital take the wheel a little bit here with Brandon yeah. Allen. Cause it's just, it's just, <laughs> there's just a lot up in the air with him. Let's move on to wide receiver. Really, really intriguing class overall at wide out. Um, you currently, the, the, the big three that everyone's talking about, Malik neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze. You have it, Neighbors, Adunze Harrison. I'm not going to talk about semantics and why you have this guy over that guy because right. it would. Who it cares? Just, it's just not. Yeah, they're all very good, right? <laughs> right. Um, I'm. What I am curious though. So with with Roma Dunze, and I, I actually wrote uh, and did a, a quick study on this and put it in my newsletter yesterday. Uh, I guess two days ago by the time people were listening to this episode, but on early declare status, right? Roma Dunze, uh, not an early declare, and people really, really emphasize early declare status in the analytics sphere uh, of this stuff. And uh, I kind of looked into this a little bit more and showed that, yes, early declare status as a standalone metric, if you were to only look at early declare status, yeah, you because early declare wide receivers, especially this day and age where you have guys transferring, you have NIL, guys staying in school longer. If a guy's coming out, it's signaling to us that, He's probably going to go pretty early in the, in the NFL draft. Like what I think we're going to see is way fewer early declare like day three guys, you know, guys yeah. who, you know, historically we've seen, you know, like a Gabe Davis or something like that. I don't think that kind of thing is going to happen anymore. But um, what what I do think with a guy like a uh is, you know, yes, he's not an early declare, but he has pretty good age adjusted production overall. And he has his breakout score is above this 80 mark, which is kind of arbitrary when I was doing the study. And basically what I found was first round wide receivers who were not early declares and had a breakout score above 80 were better than first round wide receivers who were early declares and had breakout scores under 80, right? So basically age adjusted production is far more important and trumps all of this like standalone early declare stuff than I think what other people would probably deduce to and, and, and figure out and think about. And so the thing with the Dunze though, is that a lot of that production came last season, like his, his big season was last year. And, you know, Jalen McMillan, who I, I like, I think you like Jalen McMillan a decent bit too, at least compared to like sure. a, a bulk. but you know, McMillan was a little bit banged up and maybe some, maybe that had some, but regardless, did you see things from a Dunze? Did you, I mean, maybe you didn't even really dig in that deeply with his junior season compared to his senior season, or do you think that he needed the senior season to really, really catapult himself to the status that he has now? Because I look at someone like Chris Olave, who did not need his senior season whatsoever to probably be at least a late first rounder, right? Like maybe, maybe it helped him a little bit to, to show the consistency and then be, you know, the 11th overall pick or whatever he ended up being. But do you think that this season, and it's not like a detriment per se to Adunze, I'm just speaking more to the consistency. And and look, you can even look at it as a positive because he grew and he got better, right, from his junior to senior season. But did you see the traits during his junior year or was this more focused on, on his senior season? You know, when I watch tape with these guys, I, I watch a lot more games than I even track. But just to give you an example of the games that I studied, I watched – the Oregon, the 2022 Oregon game, the 2022 Texas game, those are two that I tracked. Then I watched one, two, three, four, five, five games from 23. And then the Texas game is from 23. So that's six. I just put 24 because I'm being accurate at the date. But like, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, looking at that, not really because 
I think if more than anything, the I think I would we don't know what his motivation was, but if I were to guess, it would be I've got Michael Penix. And while everyone's sitting there saying Michael Penix benefited from all these wide receivers, well, these wide receivers benefited from Michael Penix, especially sure. from what you're telling me a little bit, you know, yeah. that we could kind of make that thing. But I think they all looked at it and said, We could win a national championship. Do I want to do I want to try and win a national championship, you know, or do yeah. I want to go into the draft? And that's a tough decision for some of these guys. So I, I think he I think he probably stayed for that. From what I saw, the the difference in his route running, the the things that he can do as a route runner, like set up releases with the the different types of footwork and hand maneuvers and the really the the craft of doing it, the patience and suddenness that you have to have a contrast in to make that work. Um, that's something that doesn't come from one summer to the next for yeah. most players. Like he showed that as a junior, yeah, um, okay. the way that you set up defenders with STEM work and all that, yeah. that doesn't happen overnight. So really it, he was essentially the same guy, maybe just a little better in Tiny situations that might be the difference between Stefan Diggs getting open against Jalen Ramsey on third and 15. Everybody knows it's coming. And maybe, um, you know, Christian Watson, um, you, you know, not getting open in that yeah. situation, yeah. but almost catching the ball anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Xavier Worthy, another guy who, you know, probably without the combine would be pegged right now as a second rounder, but because the combine matters to a handful of people uh, and people making decisions, he's potentially probably going in the first round is not now worthy. I will say I, I, I love worthy. Uh, he has the third best breakout score in this class behind neighbors and, and Marvin Harrison. I mean, he has the tools analytically that a lot of, a lot of uh, data points are favorable for him. Now, my question to you, I know that you are pretty into, into worthy as well. Do you see his ceiling as a potential Tyreek Hill, or do you see it more as a Deshaun Jackson? More Deshaun Jackson, and if I'm going to get old school, Isaac Bruce. Oh um, wow, that's a good, that's a fun one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, because like both Deshaun and Isaac, both around the same size, both tougher over the middle than you realize. That people sometimes give them credit for. Good at the catch point on back shoulders and contested plays repeated years of strong production stronger after the catch than people give credit for and worthy is all those things he he fights the ball a little bit like you, you know there's some plays you watch and if you know, like the all 22 people if they're not looking at the the other view where you can really see it sometimes he's he's got little juggles of balls that have led to drops but they're not gabe davis like yeah they're a little they're and he makes a lot tougher plays over the middle with good technique in a variety of coverage scenarios that are strong. So I'm a fan. I definitely believe he's more in that Deshaun Jackson mode because um, he's not – He's Tyreek Hill is the closest thing to Steve Smith that we've seen in recent oh, years, like yeah. you, you know, but not quite as physical as that, but in the neighborhood, you know. And I think that Worthy is more like a – Oh, he pulls through more tackles than I would expect. He doesn't go down easily, but he's not a he's not a running back in a yeah. wide receiver's body. Right, right. Doesn't yeah, makes total sense. Especially looking at Tyreek's journey, right? And and sort of how he was used in college and such, all the way to then landing in the perfect spot to get his career going in Kansas City with Andy Reid. Uh my prospect model, Matt, loves Brian Thomas like a lot, likes him a good bit. Yeah. I have some more subjective concerns. I'd say the number one subjective concern is that I have like percent matches like for, for comps and stuff. Right. And it could not find a good comp dating back to 2011 for Brian Thomas. Like, like the only comp that it, like the top comp that it spit out. And I don't even think it's really a great comp, but it was Quentin Johnston. Right. And it, but, but like that, that's what I'm saying. Like I, I, it's not that I think that that's the player that he is. It's just that I don't know in history, recent history, at least, what Brian Thomas is. If Torrey Smith was another one, which I think actually makes a little bit more sense than than a, than a QJ. But regardless, just talk me out yeah. of these like concerns that I have for Brian Thomas because I know that you seem to to be uh, at least in on him to some degree. I'm definitely in on him. He's a top five receiver for me in this class, yeah. and and you know 
my my modeling here isn't quite as sophisticated as your modeling there and it can be sleep deprived at certain times when i'm coming up with comparisons yeah. um and i you know i i'm known for giving a, a interesting range of comparisons sometimes and it was hard for me too That's i good. actually love the the quentin johnston comparison um because I would have framed it and I wish I had it. I wish I made it because <laughs> I would have, I would have said he's Quentin Johnston. I put Quentin Johnston like him just above Quentin Johnston. I'd say he's what people thought they saw. That's what, in I, Quentin that, Johnston. That's what I talked about. And then yeah. my prospect guide. And I, yeah. and, and, well, the other thing too, is that if you look at a lot of his like contested catch numbers and stuff like that, he's not, you know, Quentin Johnston, you could argue is like afraid of the ball, right? Like he just, just wasn't, wasn't powerful uh at, at his catch point and such and and whereas brian thomas at least analytically seems to be more have, have more dog in him if you yeah. will right and, and 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 the issue for me was this with quentin johnston is that he doesn't have skill with tracking the ball mm. and this is it sounds so weird to people who don't watch film they go if you're a fan you go how do you play wide receiver and not be able to track a football and the answer is is that it happens way more often than you think and i yeah. you know again good nature picking on my uh, uh, on your on your team there is sammy sammy coates oh sammy. the same yeah. guy the same guy who i was telling you who's the analytics guy i remember being at the senior bowl one year and he goes he he was texting me while i was on the field and he was somewhere else and we were meeting up later and he goes he goes, man, he goes, it would just take 10 minutes for everybody to see what Sammy Coates really is if they just did this one drill, yeah. you know, yeah. and it was and they didn't. But the thing is, is that tracking the ball it's, um for Quentin Johnson, his problem, and this relates to Brian Thomas Jr., is that when the ball's in the air, it's about positioning yourself and your hands relative to where the ball's coming on vertical routes. And that's where the tracking can be difficult in the same way as that tracking can be difficult for some people working across the middle and leaving their feet unnecessarily for a ball where they could have caught it with their hands like this. Mm. They're now doing underhand and jumping and it just, it discombobulates them to the point that they can't handle tight coverage as a result of this, or they make silly errors and drop the ball. Yeah. So Quentin Johnston, you saw consistently when the ball was at its highest point, he would jump, but then he wouldn't extend his arms to the ball. And if he did, his hands were going up and clapping like the little kid in the in the Twitter meme who's like trying to catch the big <laughs> bouncy ball and it bounces off their head. And yeah. I always call those clap attacks. And it's like, and I always I often use that meme sometimes or GIF to to show that. And you uh, sometimes certain passes are hard enough that even pro receivers have to be that little girl yeah. who misses the ball. It's just a hard attack, but there are a lot that they should be able to get. And Johnston has that problem. Brian Thomas is Johnston without that problem and the skill to actually make those plays. If, if we put them to, I wish they came out at the same time so that I could have written Quentin Johnston is what everyone's going nuts about. Brian Thomas is exactly who everyone's looking at when they're looking at, at Quentin Johnston. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. The Steelers have had a lot, you know, you brought up Sammy Coates. They've had like, you know, obviously Martavis Bryant, he's been a comp for Brian Thomas that I've seen get thrown around. Then you had like a uh, Limus Swede, you know, remember, remember back in the, that, that yeah. wasn't too, too long, maybe 15 years ago. Um, yeah. But, you know, they've had that, that archetype a little bit, but, that, I, I do. Do you, do you think there is a little bit of volatility to that archetype? Like just just naturally from a production standpoint, it can be if the guy gets pegged as a as a vertical as boundary that receiver, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. But I yeah. don't think he did too much as a route runner. I think that teams are going to see him as a potential primary receiver as opposed to the number yeah. two guy. Like yeah. he's not a he's less Mike Thomas. And while I I hate to use AJ Green as a comparison. He's more closer to that. He's if you put Quentin Johnston and AJ Green on a continuum, yeah, he's yeah. somewhere in between those guys. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, another player that we seem to share uh, a love for uh, on the field, and there's some off the field concerns, which is why he's not getting as much love as he probably should. Even still, I'm I'm shocked that a guy who played at Georgia and played well at Georgia transfers to Alabama, this other pretty small school, you know, down South goes, goes to Alabama produces, you know, within the context of his team relatively well at Alabama is not really getting talked about that much. That's Jermaine Burton. Talk to me about Jermaine Burton and why people should be higher on him. He's a quiet assassin. Well, maybe yeah. he's not that quiet, but like, he's <laughs> definitely an assassin. We'll put it that way. And kind of a Robert Woods type of player 
in the sense that he can play all three positions. He can play them well enough that you could see him starting or at least producing reasonably well in those roles. Like he's not ideally the split end like a Brian Thomas Jr. Sure, is. sure. But you could use him there and get matchups with him, and he'll win boundary plays and run good routes that you would use in the X. But he's more of a flanker who can also operate out of the slot, and that's really what Woods was. And so the route running has that nuance that you're looking for. It's not just, you know, I see a lot of film stuff. Like if I'm going to pick on the film side of things is where, you know, the film stuff, you'll see people go, he has this move and he has that move and he can do this move and he does that move, but they don't do it well. Mm. It's like having a big vocabulary, but no, not knowing how to, to piece it together, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, and you're just throwing out like a bunch of word jumble, you know, or that you're a, uh, or, or you don't know how to tell a story and you can't do it verbally with any kind of, you know, emotional emphasis and varying of your pacing or your timing or having any dramatic effect. And route running is that I joke that route running is like, Alfred Hitchcock telling his elevator story where he's in the, on an elevator and he's describing, he's like, it's on an elevator talking to Mike Nichols, I think the famous producer in at a film festival in London. And all of a sudden these women get on and he start just shifts immediately to talking about this gruesome murder. And, and he's telling it in this horrifically compelling way of what the body looked like. And everyone's like, you couldn't hear a pin drop and right. when the doors opened to the lobby nobody wanted to leave the elevator and then yeah. he just rushed right out and started talking with mike nichols like the same conversation they had before he told this gruesome murder story <laughs> and and he's like what was that he goes oh that's just my elevator story you know <laughs> yeah. and then goes on talking about his thing i mean it's the same deal like wide receivers they've got to like get you to believe mm. what it is they're selling and make you guess wrong, like think that you've guessed it and then pull the rug out from under you and do it efficiently. And that's all those things is what Jermaine Burton can do as well as catch and run and block. And he's got that he's got that dog in him yeah. and how to play. And so, yeah, I love guys like that. And, and he scored really well. I love you throwing out the Robert Woods comp because I give three statistical comps for players in the guide and Robert Woods was one of the, the comps Beautiful. for Jermaine Burton. You got to love that synergy. Got to love yes. it. Yes. Yes. Got to love it. Uh, another guy, Anaya Smith is one who I thought I was high on him. I brought him up on random shows and people haven't really been in like like understanding who he is or what he does. Uh, he sort of looks like a Curtis Samuel type to me uh, analytically. Where are you at with Smith? He's on my low – Samuel's on my low-end comparison of nice, him. Nice, nice. And Golden Tate is on my expectation oh, like of where he will develop. Yeah. Um, because they're similar career paths, really. Yeah. Both were running backs, highly recruited, played reasonably well as a running back, but maybe not quite as good between the tackles as they should be. Right. So they kicked him out to wide receiver. And then when you start watching them, you're like – Shouldn't this guy have been recruited as a wide receiver? They run routes really well, and then they catch the ball. I mean, he catches the ball like a 10-year veteran. I mean, yeah. like extends you know, high, low, away from his frame, digs out, throws, tight coverage doing it, hard hits. And then after the catch, he might be the best runner after the catch that, that was there. Paul Pertichese from Saturday to Sunday, um, that website that they do strong work, um, and you know, a lot of film based Devi type of stuff. I, I joked with Paul, I said, if you and I had never met before, we'd be instant friends because you just told me that you like Anaya Smith. I mean, like that's, <laughs> I mean, like, I, so now someone I haven't met before, I'd be like, I told him, I said, I'd buy him a beer. I'd be like, you know, <laughs> you, you know, that's how I feel because he's one of my favorite players in this class. Yeah. It's just that he has some really bad off field stuff to, to be concerned about and it's because he had a dwi and in the same arrest marijuana possession um and um illegal and illegal um permit in terms of not having a permit with a gun illegal mm -hmm. possession of firearm yeah. don't care about the firearm or the marijuana because we all know the realities of like sure. you know but the dwi was the issue that i think people are going to have more concerns about and understandably so if he can show that he's grown past that to me he could develop into what we saw at Golden Tate's peak, which is a, a slot receiver who can give you high volume as a receiver and then also yardage and production on the outside when needed and can get deep on you on the outside yeah. with selected matchups. So I'm a big fan. 
real quick, I got three more guys I just want to talk about sure. because I think they're three of the more polarizing, interesting guys in the class. Xavier Leggett, his production profile, easily one of the strangest I've ever seen in my entire time doing this, does nothing uh, for the first four years of his career there in South Carolina. And then last year, just absurd, just an absolutely insane uh, season. So, so my question to you is, why did that happen? And does it matter to you that it happened? Um, I don't know why it happened. I have no <laughs> idea. Um, you know, other than that, probably, you know, injuries, maybe nagging injuries were part of the issue. So he just didn't get the opportunity on the field. Um, they did have some talent at South Carolina to at least a degree that was maybe compelling enough to go without him when he wasn't fully healthy. Yeah. Um, but and then also maybe him just jobbing well with Spencer Radler towards the end. So that worked out. Right. But he's, he, to me, I don't really care that much. Um, I, I look at it as more, he's an Alshon Jeffrey like talent who to me with a little bit more explosion to his game, who could be a boundary receiver and give you a little bit more. There's some, there's some bend in his game that could make him a good route runner that's better than a more complete route runner than DK Metcalf, which is often a common comparison I see yeah, with is, a model yeah. for him. Um, I see him more in the range of, if it doesn't work out, he's Marquez North. And, and a lot of people go, who was that? He was Tennessee receiver at one good year, I believe, mm -hmm. who was big, strong, fast, and had a cup of coffee with the Rams for, you know, for a yeah. while. But, you know, if it really works out and his game continues to develop, He's maybe a little more David Boston, like before the Roids, you know, yeah, okay. like that's, you know, and, you know, Ohio State David Boston and that kind of and Cardinals David Boston before that. So yeah. I, I, there's a range here, but it's a wide range. He's the guy that I look at and go, even if he, he's got a high score for me, which would have put him top five maybe last year. Yeah. But even then, I probably would have gone, this is one of the biggest boom bust yes. scores of yeah. the guys that I have in this, that I've ever scored at this this position. Yeah. Speaking of boom bust, Malachi Corley, um, he, I'll, I'll talk about this, his comps for me. Cause I think it's, it's interesting because every year we get, this is Debo Samuel, right? Like this is the next Debo Samuel. This is the next Debo Samuel. I would agree with Corley that he's built like Debo Samuel and he does things like Debo Samuel. But my counterpoint to the Debo Samuel thing is I don't think Debo Samuel is Debo Samuel outside of San Francisco, you know, like to, Agreed. to, to that degree, like, like yeah. sure. Maybe they, another, another scheme and coordinator is going to use him creatively the way that they, that Shanahan uses him. But I just don't think that Debo Samuel is what we think of Debo, Debo Samuel outside of that environment. Right. To me, Corley analytically, whether you're looking at his production, his size is an, is more so like another guy who came out that everyone comped to Debo Samuel. That's Amari Rogers. Like he, oh. he he looks exactly like him on paper, way more like him than Debo, which is why it scares me that he's getting this second round hype and that, you know, he's going to be a day two guy. And, uh, you know, I can see especially his, his, his draft capital actually being a little bit better because of the new kickoff rules. I could see a team maybe wanting to use him creatively in that way. But what's your feel for Corley? Is he going to be a legit player or is he more a gadget player? I think gadget is where he starts and he yeah. has potential to be more, but he hasn't shown really great skill as a man-to-man -man route runner. Not, you know, you're going to see some clips where he does the old – you know, spin a Rooney at the trash can, double move somebody and get open one on one. And somebody goes, see, he's a yeah. good man to man route runner. But yeah. I'm talking about more subtlety against guys who aren't going to get fooled by that. In the yeah. NFL. Um, so right now, my comp for him is ranges from the bottom end is our Darius Stewart, the former oh, yeah. Alabama wide receiver who had a cup of coffee with the Jets, who who was a very powerful runner, but really couldn't do much more. Um, then there's. Cordero Patterson, which is where yeah. I think is really where he lies, is that against zone, using him on schemed plays, yeah, run through you, run over you, make you re remember DJ Moore, Debo Samuel, certainly guys like that. But the route nuance isn't there. He's a good, you know, with man to man. So if he can prove that, that, uh, that he can develop over the next two to three years, he'll emerge as a starter. If he doesn't develop that, He's a high-end gadget player who, in the right fit, gives you a high-end outcome. Without the right fit, he's a tease. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, last guy I want to talk about, Adonai Mitchell. I think you're a little bit lower on him than where he's getting pushed up right now because, I, I mean, I, I heard Schefter on a podcast, on the ETR podcast yesterday, uh, talking about how Mitchell is likely to go higher than even what certain books might be saying and where where he might go. He He's feeling like at least early 20s, low 20s in terms of his draft capital. Uh, analytically, I have a ton of issues with Adonai Mitchell. There's a lot of inconsistencies. There's just a lot of... He is a scary, scary prospect, and we do not see first-round wide receivers with this profile. This is one of those early declare... Uh, bad breakout score type guys where the hit rate is very, very low historically. So I have some concerns. What are your concerns with him? Yeah, I mean, I think for him, he's he's that guy who could be the vertical receiver who's a who's a better impact in an NFL lineup than a fantasy lineup. Yeah. You know? So yeah. that's the pro side, okay? That productive secondary starter, Henry Ruggs type of player maybe. Um, but really – how well he performs and gets that shot is how well he can develop a short and intermediate passing game, which is not very strong right now. Um, you know, he doesn't really get defenders to believe that he can, that he's going to beat them with timing routes. Um, and if you can't do that, they're just going to play the vertical game on you all day long. Yeah. And that's kind of where he is right now. His breaks aren't very flat or sharp. You know, he's got to refine the releases that he has and how to bait defenders. Um, he doesn't drop the ball often, but the way that he attacks the ball always reminds me of Terry McLaurin. And Terry McLaurin, to me, is the bumblebee, I would say this a lot, of the bumblebee of wide receivers where, you know, by the law of physics, he should not be able to catch a football <laughs> as consistently as he does. And I will – and I will – I would – I would – Kill my career if you gave me a hundred players who caught the ball, tried to catch a ball like Terry McLaurin, and I will grade them poorly every time. Yeah. Um, until I got to a hundred out of a hundred that could show me that times have changed. Yeah. And that all of them can do it. I'll just say, fine, now I'll change because McLaurin is the exception to the rule. And I think Mitchell needs to to work on those things. So the talents there in terms of where it can all work together, but there's a lot of little things. And when that happens, all those strings tend to, you pull the suit, you pull those strings on the suit and it just falls apart. Yeah, man. And in this class, there's a big opportunity cost with that, right? Where if you're, if you're taking that on, whether in your rookie draft or an NFL team taking that on, you know, you're missing out on some pretty, pretty good talent at wide receiver. And the McLaurin thing's funny too, because that's a huge model miss for me is just that he, his his production profile like was just non-existent at Ohio State. I mean, I'll go just... down. The, I'll go down with the ship on guys like that. <laughs> yeah, I just don't. Good. I mean, dude, yeah, I, he's great, and I love watching him, and I right. marvel at how great he is at that. But Gabriel Davis is in that model, and we've seen yeah. the ups and downs with him. Yeah, know? we've seen that. We've seen that go south. Matt, this was a pleasure, man. This is this was uh, needed to happen about ten years earlier than it actually it did. did. And thank you for being the one to do it. I, I wish I had. I wish I had done to do, had an, an opportunity to do this as well, but we'll have to we'll have to amend that because this was a Absolutely. lot of fun. Absolutely, uh, let everyone know where they can find you, find RSP, all that good stuff. Sure, mattwaldman.com is where you can buy the RSP. You get a pre-draft and post-draft for twenty one ninety five. Um, it's one of the two most purchased draft guides um, by NFL people, according to recruiters like Alex Brown over at Ole Miss who meets with these guys on a weekly basis. Um, you get, you know, it's really, it's football written from a fantasy eye, you know, from, mm-hmm. or really the opposite. Um, I do a projections and rankings package. You can also get, if you just want quick answers. Um, I saw that for a little more because all the work I'd put into the film stuff. So it's like, you're, if you're going to cheat, you're going to get, you're going to pay a little more for yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but you get that. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Matt Waldman, my, my content sites, mattwaldmanrsp.com, YouTube, Matt Waldman's RSP Film Room, where I have a podcast. I do about five different podcasts during the week, usually, um, with a variety of guests from from with a with cool backgrounds ranging from FSWA Fantasy Writer of the Year Adam Harstead. Congratulations to him, yeah. you know, and and the and the great work he does with models and things like that. To Brandon Angelo, who is a a track and field expert and athletic training expert, who has his own 
work at Angelo Analysis. That's a fantastic subscription site that's worth checking out. So, of course, that guy Bob Harris, where yeah. we do a show that's a little more profane. That yeah, we he's, a, he's, he's a decent, decent human he's, being. He's, he's an all right guy. Yeah, yeah. he's all right. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would also say anyone listening to this, if you want a really good compliment to the stuff that I'm doing, RSP is that compliment. It's perfect. I mean, it's it's I, the, the prospect guide you're going to get, uh, you know, the analytical analytically driven stuff and the model stuff, all that. Uh, but you can really look at what Waldman's doing and say, oh, if Matt likes this guy and JJ likes this guy, maybe we'll get an Isaiah Pacheco once again out of this class. So definitely check that out. Totally you know, agree. You can get all my stuff over on LateRound.com. As always, everyone, greatly appreciate you listening, and thanks for tuning in.